Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Multicultural Advisory Board, I'd like to welcome you to our annual International Holocaust Remembrance Day program. The Office of Multicultural and International Student Affairs provides leadership in the university's efforts to support students, inform the campus community of the values of multiculturalism, and assist in encouraging a campus environment that is committed to diverse student learning. Today's program will highlight several aspects of the Holocaust and its impact on the world. In our attempt to increase cultural awareness in our campus community, we hope that today's event will foster inquiry into contemporary issues raised by the study of the Holocaust, worldwide genocides, and human rights. The Multicultural Advisory Board, made up of faculty, staff, and students, has been very instrumental in ensuring that programs such as these are implemented at Francis Marion University. At this time, I would love members of the Multicultural Advisory Board to please stand and be recognized. I just want to remind everyone, um, that as you received your programs at the registration table, you also should have received an evaluation form. If you would, at the completion of the program, complete those forms and return them to the registration table, that would greatly help us improve upon our program and offerings. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, our guest speaker today is Rabbi Dobern Shore. She is qualified. She is an ordained reform rabbi with 20 years of experience in Jewish education. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy, magna cum laude, from Pomona College in 1999 and was ordained as rabbi in 2005 from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York. She has served congregations in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and Westfield, New Jersey. Since 2012, Rabbi Dobern Shore has served as a rabbi at Beth Israel Congregation in Florence, South Carolina. She has taught at Temple Sine in Sumter, South Carolina, and at the Tree of Life Congregation and Congregation Beth Shalom, both in Columbia, South Carolina. Rabbi Dobrin Shore enjoys speaking before community groups and she has offered presentations to many community and college groups in the state, including groups from the University of South Carolina, Palmetto Hospital, and Agape Hospice. She blogs at palmettorabbi.com. Rabbi Dobrin Shore resides in Columbia with her husband, Dr. Adam Shore, and her two children. Our guest speaker. Thank you, and thank you all, and to the uh, Office of Multi Multicultural Affairs and the Multicultural Advisory Board for inviting me here this afternoon. So as a rabbi, the legacy of the Holocaust is something that I and my community continue to wrestle with and to struggle with. We seek to learn and to try to understand how the events of those years happened in their particularity, what they mean, and then also to try to understand the types of lessons and meaning we can draw from them today. We have very few people left alive who firsthand experienced that time, and so it falls on people like me to offer up some of their voices, which you will hear in this presentation today, as way of remembering and understanding. The topic of the Holocaust can be overwhelming, so I thought I would start just with a very general definition. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the Holocaust was the systematic, bureaucratic, state-sponsored persecution and murder of six million Jews by the Nazi regime and its collaborators. Of course, the Holocaust did not just target Jews. Over 10 million individuals, men and women and children, were murdered in the Holocaust. The Nazis targeted the mentally and physically disabled, the Roma people, religious dissidents, political dissidents. Approximately six million of those murdered were Jewish. Approximately one and a half million murdered were children. The era began in 1933 when the Nazi party came to power and ended in 1945 with the end of the Second World War. 
Hitler and the Nazi regime made no secret that their goal was genocide, which means basically the intent to destroy the existence of an entire group. Of course, the Holocaust was by no means the first or the last genocide in human history. But prior to the Second World War, approximately nine and a half million Jews lived in Europe where they had lived for centuries. And before I flip over, I would have you note in particular, you see like there's three million Jews in Poland, right? Or look at the numbers down in Greece or these other places. By the end of the war, two out of three European Jews were murdered, which was at the time the largest Jewish community in the world. And I would note the only, you, I'll flip back so you can look at the numbers, the only reason the numbers in France stayed the same is because after the war there was a huge migration of Jews from North Africa into France, which replaced the a population of Jews. So you can see the year in 1950. I couldn't find one from 1945. And it's truly hard for us to comprehend these types of numbers. Right? How would we imagine 6 million, 10 million people, 6 million candles, 6 million photographs, each a beloved husband or grandfather or niece or friend? These are images of people that we might recognize, right? At a family reunion, little children in a bedroom, or on a street out shopping getting ready for a wedding. These are all people who, by and large, in these photographs were no longer after the Holocaust. And there are millions and millions of these photos, right? Children at school, this looks like a high school, out for a day with the family. What are we to do in the face of this type of loss? A tradition has arisen in the state of Israel on Yom HaShoah, which is the Holocaust Memorial Day in Israel, to stand for a minute in silence. And the whole country stops. People stop and get out of their cars and stand out of their businesses to stand in memory and to stand in witness. But I think bearing witness is more than just a memory. It also is an obligation to tell those stories, not just so the Holocaust won't happen again, but so we can better understand what happened and we can stop the spread of hate. When you begin to tell a story like that, you have to choose a moment to start. And I begin with an event somewhat in the middle, November 9th to 10th of 1938, which is called Kristallnacht, meaning the night of broken glass. It was a night of state-sponsored terror against the German Jewish community and the Jewish communities in Austria and the Sudetenland, which had been annexed by Germany. It was incited and planned by the Nazi government. Instructions, which were sent in a telegram from Reinhard Heydrich, who was the head of their secret police across the country, they contained orders that the Jewish homes and synagogues, which is our house of worship, and businesses were to be destroyed. And here you can see a very typical uh, a Jewish owned business completely destroyed after that night. No German lives or property were to be harmed. In fact, they were to be protected. And you'll notice in this language that already Jews in Germany who had lived there hundreds of years, who were citizens, who had fought with honor and distinction in their military, were no longer citizens. The telegram further ordered that no foreigners, not even Jewish foreigners, were to be subjected to violence. Synagogue archives were re to be removed before they destroyed the synagogue. Right? This was a planned event. Police officials were ordered to arrest as many young men as they could pref you know, and hold them in jails. And if those guidelines were followed, then the police would just let the violence happen. The firefighters would just let the flames burn stopping only if those flames would threaten nearby, you know, businesses or homes that weren't Jewish. And so you can see photo after photo from that night. Here is a main synagogue up in flames. And I would note, as you look at these types of pictures, the people who just stand and watch. That night, almost every single synagogue in those German areas was destroyed, which was about 267. You can see windows in a synagogue. 
Here is the interior ransacked of a synagogue in Vienna. Here, if you look in the back, you will see behind the police officer, there are in fact little children just watching this. They were taken out to see this. These were German, or, German children watching the desecration of the synagogue objects. You can see more stores. All of the German-owned, Jew, the Jewish businesses, which was about 7,500, were destroyed. The cemeteries were desecrated. Here is a, sem a memorial hall at a cemetery. And again, note the people standing and watching. Jewish homes were entered and vandalized. Over 100 Jewish men were, um, excuse me, over 100 Jews were murdered that night. And more than 30,000 Jews were rounded up and taken to concentration camps. This was the first mass roundup and here you can see the German civilians lining up to watch that march of Jews who had been rounded up in that town. One survivor testimony talks about how her father was arrested that night and brought, you know, with the SS to the, with the Jewish men in the square and as an attempt at humiliation, the officer said, we want all of you to take out the shoelaces from your shoes. Her father protested this and they made an example of him and killed him so that all of the other people would fall in line. Another survivor who was a child talks about hiding in a wardrobe with her aunts and having an intense desire to get out, meaning not just of the wardrobe, right, but of Germany and away from that danger. And another survivor talks about how she lived in Berlin and she she saw, she ran and she saw all of the synagogues burning and so she had a sister living in Munich. She got on a train to Munich. She thought she would be safe there. And of course, the same thing was happening that night in Munich. And that's when she realized it was all over and that she wouldn't be safe. And here is again just another picture of those men being rounded up. So, Kristallnacht, for many scholars and Holocaust historians, marks a type of turning point. Prior to that night, there was discrimination and acts of violence against the Jewish communities in Germany and Austria, but they might have thought or hoped it, the Nazi regime would be but a passing phase. And after Kristallnacht, it was apparent that they had to leave and as quickly as possible. But as we'll see, virtually every door of escape was closed to that community. And at the same time, when the Nazis saw how many people stood by, how little public outcry there was in their own country, they realized that they might be able to increase the violence against the Jewish community. The US Holocaust Memorial Museum says, the passivity with which most German civilians respond to the violence signaled to the Nazi regime that the German public was prepared for more radical measures. And as we know, those radical measures led to all of those millions and millions and millions of murders. When I've taught about the Holocaust, students say, well, how did we even get to this level of violence? What even made that possible? And then they ask, and so why didn't the Jews just leave? They saw this happening, why didn't they just do something? So let's begin with the first question about how hatred could even rise to that type of level. Many Holocaust educators emphasize that Kristallnacht and the Holocaust didn't come out of the blue. Hatred has to be taught and nurtured, right? Four-year-olds and three-year-olds don't know about hatred unless they're taught it. And unless it's grown, it doesn't manifest in that way. And many of them explain the idea of this growth through what they call a pyramid of hate. And as you can see, at the lowest level are things like added prejudice, prejudiced attitudes, accepting stereotypes, scapegoating, etc., which then go up to acts of prejudice and discrimination and violence, right? It rises and grows. Hatred builds and creates that type of an environment. And I would note that even prior to the Holocaust, right, there had been prejudice and stereotypes in the form of anti-Semitism directed against the Jews. So the Nazi regime tapped into these types of ideas and made it possible step by step 
to turn those ideas into something that everybody was talking about and really thought and then acted upon. So at the lowest level of the pyramid, right, were those prejudiced attitudes. And one way people engage in those prejudiced attitudes is by stereotypical thinking. You're probably familiar with that, right? A stereotype is a thought like all X are smart, all Y are pretty, all Z are lazy. And the problem with the stereotype is that instead of seeing people as individuals, they lump people into categories which cause us to see people differently, which cause us to think of them differently and to treat them differently. And even a stereotype which we might think of as positive, all A are studious, all B are athletic, poses problems because once again, we're not seeing people as who they are but as part of a group. And the sad truth is most stereotypes, or a vast many, are dangerous or are harmful, right? All K are violent. All L are lazy, all M are stupid, and they perpetuate false ideals and plant seeds of distrust. And you'll notice that even as I'm speaking about stereotypes, right, I'm not actually naming any groups because I don't want us to be sitting here thinking this group and that image, right? It's that idea. And the problem with prejudicial thinking is that many of us engage in it without even being fully aware that we're doing it. Project Implicit, which was developed by researchers from Harvard and other top universities, if you go online, they have a tool to measure what they call implicit prejudice, implicit bias, and it finds that even those of us who think of ourselves as the most accepting and most affirming, we hold biases. So they're there, but then they can be lifted up, right, and made, instead of something we're working to work through, something that becomes normal and then even ideal. And indeed, when I teach about the Holocaust, I ask my students to think if they have ever experienced or participated in sharing or perpetrating um, negative stereotypes. And if we're honest, right, I'm not going to ask us to raise our hand, but probably all of our hands should go up because it, all of us at some point have heard people or participated in that or have thought those types of thoughts ourselves. Alongside prejudiced thinking comes scapegoating, which is blaming a larger complex problem, a real and scary problem, on a small group of people, usually a group of people that we already have negative stereotypes and prejudice about, right? And in the case of Nazi Germany, there really were deep problems. Germany had lost the First World War and had to pay very punishing reparations. They had to pay lots of money because they lost. Their economy was profoundly affected by the Great Depression. Their unemployment grew from one and a half million in 1929 to six million, at least in 1933, the year the Nazis took power. And so there was a real problem there, right? And Hitler and the Nazi party saw scapegoating as a way to unify people to their ideas and their thoughts and as a way to solidify their power. But the problem with scapegoating, right, is that it fans the flames of hatred and it doesn't bring people together to productively address societal problems. And we know the Nazis are not unique in the use of scapegoating. We here, in our political discourse today, complicated political problems placed squarely on the shoulders of certain minority groups or certain religious groups. So as we learn about what happened in Nazi Germany, we also have to remember the danger of scapegoating and the fact that it will do little to help us productively come together to address the issues we do face. So by systematically engaging in these stereotypes and scapegoating, the Nazis took hateful thoughts about the Jews and disabled people and Roma people and political dissidents, all of these types of folks, and made them socially acceptable. And they did this very intentionally through a campaign of propaganda. That is a biased information campaign. Hitler wrote about it in Mein Kampf. And as soon as he came to power in 1933, he established a Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda. And they put out lots and lots and lots of propaganda of all sorts, right? This is the ideal German 
come support the Nazis, and they were perpetuating all of these hateful ideas. They did not have Facebook or Twitter or social media, but they used all of the tools at their disposal in their day, whether it was literature, magazines, newspapers, uh, posters. They created films. They even created children's books. They created curricula for schools. It could not be avoided. I have to say, I did bring a few of the images, and I, I had a tension, right? Do I bring the images and show images about this type of hateful thought? Because that, you know, we see it, but then if we don't see even a few samples, we won't understand the types of images that were bombarding the German population. So with that caveat, I am going to show you a few images so that we can understand the types of images that were put up again and again and again, right? So here, this is a propaganda from a film strip. And the caption states, you can see very negative images of people here, right? The, the Jew, it, I, I'm going to quote what he says. It says, the Jew is a bastard. And then it says, just like these other groups we don't like, such as Eastern people, blacks, Mongols, and East Africans, right? They were going to try to separate good Germans from what they perceived. Please understand what they perceived. As, you know, as, as non-Germans, right? So here you see a friendship, but it says actually the result, a loss of racial pride. And here you see an anti-Jewish propaganda book called The Poison Mushroom. There's children reading from it. Um, the little girl to the side is holding its companion volume. Uh, let me get the name of the book. Uh, Trust No Fox. And you can see here... Um, this is the interior of a page, right, where they're showing maybe Jews have different physical features. The books go on like that, <laughs> right? And here, this was a very popular film called The Eternal Jew. And again, it was also then linking Jews, you see, with the sickle and hammer with the Soviet Union, which was, um, by the time the film came out in 1940, a Nazi enemy, right? So not only are Jews horrible, they're in fact linked with our enemies. Enough of those images, right? <laughs> Enough. Um, but in the case of children, that meant this was how things were. And in the case of everybody else, it was so ubiquitous, it couldn't be ignored. And it was not just normal, but even ideal, what it was to be a good citizen to think these types of thoughts. And so it was easy to move on to the next level of that pyramid, which we talked about being... Um, acting on the prejudice. And again, at the beginning, it doesn't seem like it could be that bad. It's name calling or belittling jokes or social exclusion or social avoidance. But remember that things build. And there is a story told by a survivor about how she had grown up and went to school alongside her Gentile neighbors and always had you know, friendships with them. And one year, it came time for her birthday party. And her mom sent out invitations and made a party and none of her Gentile friends from school came. Now we can say that's not such a big deal, except for this was right after Hitler began taking power and these types of images and messages popped up. And it was saying that this little girl was already different, was already not like her classmates, could already be treated differently and avoided. And if that starts going in broader and broader circles of avoidance and exclusion, then people stop seeing each other as friends and coworkers and neighbors. Indeed, she said that that party was the day the Holocaust came into her life, in retrospect. So the next level in that pyramid is organized and legalized discrimination. And the Nazis had many tactics. It began with a series of laws passed in 1933, with then the Nuremberg Laws passed in 1935. Those laws stripped the Jews of German citizens. This is a headline from an American newspaper reporting on it. Reich, that's the German government, places Jews back in the Middle Ages, right? In the Middle Ages, the Jews couldn't be citizens of any country. We, and then we became citizens. We were granted rights, the right to vote, to serve in the army, to all of the types of rights we associate with citizenship. And the German government took all of them away, despite the fact that Jews had not only been citizens, but served in office, had been in the military. 
ultimately over 400 laws were passed, everything from forcing Jews to register separately. Their passports were famously marked with a J. Here you can see this girl's passport has a J on it. Her middle name was Sarah. The Nazis forced Jewish people to take certain names as middle names. They even in some places said these were the names you could choose to name your babies. Um, there were Jews, there were laws removing Jews from civil services, that means government jobs. That's not just a loss of income, but then you have a whole bunch of people who are no longer in positions to be able to advocate for each other, right? They closed the Jewish, the, um, they stopped allowing Jewish children to go to the public schools or to go to university, and so the Jewish community hastily set up their own schools. But once again, all of those interactions were curtailed. Jews couldn't have automobiles. Eventually, they couldn't own businesses. Prior to that, there were boycotts of Jewish businesses. The sign says, Germans, defend yourselves. Don't buy from Jews. So that was before. Eventually, they couldn't own businesses. Here, this sign says, um, Jews are unwanted here. And there were, those were placed all over as well. A survivor who came to speak in Colombia about three or four years ago, he was from Czechoslovakia, talked about when the Nazis came into his country. And unlike in Germany, where they came to power in 1933 and the laws built when they came into Czechoslovakia, they all went into effect overnight. So first he went, woke up and he found out he couldn't go to school. He then said he went to the park, but there was a sign there saying that he couldn't go there. So he thought to take a swim at the beach by the river. And of course, that was closed. And then he learned that he was no longer allowed on his soccer team. His entire world had closed off to him. And the legal discrimination and all of that propaganda, right, it just built and create an environment where violence was possible. And even before Kristallnacht, there was violence against Jewish um, individuals. There is a story where the famous Russia, Russian composer Igor Stravinsky was on a visit to Germany, and he was having dinner with a Jewish friend. There were some uh, Nazi officials in the restaurant who started harassing his friend, who proceeded to beat up his friend. Um, they went to a police officer. The police officer would not help them. They were able to finally get a taxi and go to safety, and when they went before a judge, the judge said, well, that's just what's happening here. That's just commonplace. And so you get the stage set for the type of widespread, nationwide mass violence of the Kristallnacht pogrom. And as I've mentioned, following that night, the Nazis took note of those bystanders, and they realized that it would be possible to escalate what they were doing. According to many scholars, the Nazis were able to succeed because of the silence and inaction of so many people. As the US Holocaust Memorial Museum puts it, throughout the Holocaust, millions of people silently stood by while they saw Jews, Roma, and other enemies of the Reich being rounded up and deported. Many of these bystanders told themselves that what they saw happening was none of their business, and others were too frightened to help. And because the majority of civilians remained, if not collaborators, right, actively helping the Nazis, then bystanders, unwilling or unable to speak up, that hatred could grow. And of course, as the Nazis solidified their power, it became more and more dangerous and difficult to speak up. And that, of course, points to the importance of speaking up at an early stage when it's easier to stop, maybe it doesn't seem like quite as big a problem, but when it is earlier to come and take action. So then we turn to the next question, why didn't the Jews just leave? The painful truth is the vast majority of Jews in those Nazi-controlled areas desperately wanted to leave, and there was no place to go. Even before Kristallnacht, up to a quarter of the community had left, and many more wanted to go. But the problem was most of the nations of the world had what were called immigration quotas, which meant they said, we'll allow this number of people from this country and this number from that country, and so they would not take refugees. They even convened a conference in the summer of 1938 called the Avion Conference about the problem of the refugees. And all the countries of the world sent delegates, 
and delegate after delegate from all the countries stood up and said things like, I'll broadly paraphrase, we are so sorry about the plight of the refugees. It is just awful what is happening, but we regret that our country is unable to do anything, yada, yada. And here, in fact, is a political cartoon from the era, from the New York Times. You can see it says, will the Avion Conference guide him to freedom? The person, you see the swastika, right, the symbol of the Nazis. And there, it's the person here says non-Aryan, somebody who is not, would be persecuted by Hitler. And I think the person looks like he's wearing a kippah, so it looks Jewish. And you see it says, go, go, go. And all the signs say, stop, stop, stop. There was nowhere to go. In late 1938, excuse me, 125,000 applicants lined up at the U.S. consulates, hoping to obtain just 27,000 visas. And by June 1939, there were 300,000 applicants with lines down the street, around the corner. You can see um, contemporary American and political cartoons. This one says the Mayflower, right? If you'll remember, the Mayflower brought people to America in its idealized telling for religious freedom. And so you see the Mayflower is labeled World Rescue Era Efforts, but the ship has already sailed away, leaving racial and religious refugees stranded on the rocky shores. In this image, the best answer to racial persecution, you find somebody advocating in America that humanity, that hand, lend out assistance to the refugees. But Amer efforts in this country failed. There was even a bill proposed, the Wagner-Rogers bill, to admit um, about 20,000 refugee children, and that was defeated. And this was not just the case in our country, but in nation after nation. This is an article several days after Kristallnacht from the New York Times. It talks about how the Jews in Germany had gone to the Netherlands to try to go in. They were on their knees begging for entry, literally. Um, they literally went on their knees in imploring Netherland officials to allow them to pass. But Netherland frontier guards have been doubled and strict orders have been given to prevent any refugee invasion. In an isolated act of mercy, Great Britain took in um, about 10,000 refugee children on the kinder transport, which were trains that went from Germany, Austria, and parts of Czechoslovakia with only children those quotas were not relaxed for adults. And I have thought, especially as I've become a mother, what type of awful situation it would be to say, I'm going to put my baby on a train to another country where I might never see him or her again. I don't even know who's going to be taking care of my child. But the option of my child remaining here is that dangerous. And even as we celebrate the lives of the children saved in the kinder transport, that really just highlights that there was almost nowhere to go. And I even, I skipped over, there was, this is a boat, the St. Louis, and I skipped over that as I spoke, not, which um, set sail. They had, they had visas for Cuba. For some reason, they were denied entry into Cuba. They made it up to um, near where they could see the lights of Miami, but the U.S. Coast Guard ships forced them to turn around. And here are parents waving goodbye to the kinder transport trains. And here are the children coming off of the kinder transport in Great Britain. And there's actually a wonderful documentary about the kinder transport that also talks about a lot of what I've spoken about called Into the Arms of Strangers. So a painful portion of Holocaust education is explaining to my students which I just explained a few weeks ago to my sixth and seventh graders, how the world saw the plight of the Jewish community and didn't act. And I would just note as an aside that this is one of the reasons that for the vast majority of the world's Jewish population, the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 has been so important. Because with a history of anti-Semitism culminating in the Holocaust, our people wanted to have some safe haven, and indeed since the establishment of the State of Israel, about 600,000 Jews have fled violence and persecution in North Africa. That was between 1948 and 1972 from places like Tunisia, uh, Yemen, Morocco, Egypt, and come to Israel. 
tens of thousands of Ethiopian Jews were airlifted to Israel in emergency airlifts in the 1980s. And in recent years, one and a half million Jews have come, at least from the former Soviet Union, to Israel. But to return to our discussion on the Holocaust, we also asked, so why didn't the nations of the world do more? According again to the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, widespread racial prejudices among Americans played a part in the failure to admit more refugees. Our own prejudice prevented our nation from taking action. And so, in fact, Hitler gloated about this after the Avion Conference. He said, well, what I'm doing must not be that bad because none of you want to take them. I mean, I'm paraphrasing wildly, but that's the type of thing that they said. You know, sometimes we think if I don't do anything, it's just not my problem that that's not doing anything. But really, doing nothing is as much of a choice as doing something because doing nothing, just like doing something, carries a consequence. Now, as the Nazi regime grew in power, it became increasingly perilous to take action. And yet, even so, there were those who famously did make other choices. Yad Vashem, the Israeli Holocaust Memorial Museum, calls these individuals the righteous Gentiles. I've mentioned the kinder transport. There was a case when the, when the Nazis invaded Denmark the Danish community saved about 7,200 7, of their 8,000 Jews. And then of the 500 or so who were deported to concentration camps, the vast majority, all but 50, survived because the Danish government kept asking about the well-being of its citizens. In another famous, oh, in fact, this is one of the Danish uh, rescue, fishing boats that, where the Jews were smuggled because Denmark is right at the top um, of Europe, kind of, and there's you know, the sea to um, neutral Sweden, so they would smuggle the Jews secretly in the night in just normal people's fishing boats. In another instance, in 1943, in Berlin, the Nazi government rounded up the lat was doing like one of their final roundups of Jews, and this roundup included a lot of Jews who were married to what the Nazis called Aryans. And they were taken to this Rosenstrasse building, but when um, their relatives, who were not Jewish, saw that they hadn't come home. They went and said, what happened to our relatives? And in fact, a group, mostly wives, gathered outside this building and said, we want our husbands back. And they gathered as a group, and as a result, the Nazis released those being held. Most people think it's because they didn't want that story to be publicized in the media, right? So they said, okay. And in fact, we know the power of speaking up because the folks being held who did not have relatives speaking up for them were not released. Now, I would be naive to suggest that all it took to stop the Nazis was like to stand up and speak out. But this would not, I, this would be a false story as well if I acted like there was nothing anybody could do. Because we have cases like these and other cases where people, whether as individuals, or whether as groups, or as governments, did take action, and lives were saved. Now, sometimes it seems that the Holocaust happened in a galaxy, excuse me, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? The images are black and white. The people spoke another language. There are fewer people who can come and stand before us and share their lived experience of that time. But when we think of the Holocaust as a world apart, instead of as a part of our world, we risk distancing ourselves from the events instead of learning from them. And I would suggest that the danger of that pyramid of hate that it shows, right, the danger of acting as a bystander, those lessons are as true today as they were all those years ago. When I talk about the Holocaust, I say how many of us have heard or repeated a hateful stereotype or a racist remark? How many of us have heard or repeated a hateful joke, whether about somebody's actual or perceived race or religion or sexuality or gender or appearance or disability or learning difference? And I realize, and I apologize here, and I had it in my 
in, in my notes, when I mentioned all those groups the Nazis targeted, of course they targeted homosexuals, and it just, as I read it, it didn't make it into my list. And I say, how many of us have ever experienced social isolation? When we study the Holocaust, we see those acts as the manifestations of hatred that they are, and we can challenge ourselves to stop that as best we can in our own lives, to speak up when we hear hateful speech or see social exclusion. The teachings of tolerance are at their most important in difficult and challenging times, times when we are afraid or responding to crisis in the world. Because as Holocaust educators suggest, these are precisely the times we are most at risk of accepting stereotypes and turning to scapegoating. And so regardless of what's going on in the world, we have a civic duty to speak up when those in elected offices or our candidates for a higher office would fan the flames of hatred for their own ends. And I think this election cycle, we need to be especially vigilant when we hear, if we hear, candidates perpetuating prejudice or engaging in scapegoating, particularly against Muslim Americans, as we have heard. And how do we respond? By speaking out for what we believe in. Because as Americans, we have so many reasons to be proud of our nation that has been a home and safe haven to so many. My great-grandparents, all of them, came at the turn of the last century fleeing violence against Jews in Eastern Europe, and I am so grateful they came here, and I've been able to live here. And I am proud of the ideals our nation holds, that we're all created equal, of our rights to religious diversity and the important role we have for tolerance. And when we stand up for these values or do our best to live up to them, then we are proud as a nation. And I would suggest that our nation's moments of greatest regret are when we acted out of hatred towards each other, when we insisted there were differences between some of them and all of us. I don't, wherever you want to put the them or the us. When we passed laws that valued some lives over other lives. Growing up in California, I learned about and drove by some of the sites where some 120,000 Japanese Americans, many of them citizens, were interned during the Second World War. Not because they posed a real security threat that would stand up to rational scrutiny, but based on rumors and fear-mongering and prejudice. Indeed, Japanese Americans served with honor and distinction in that war, and in 1988, under the Reagan administration, the government formally apologized and paid restitution to those interned in the camps. Or to come closer to home, I think about a conversation I had with Dr. Katya Velo of the Religion Studies Department and Jewish, prog uh, Jewish Studies Program at the University of South Carolina. She said, imagine being an immigrant to this country from Nazi Germany between the 1930s and 1950s. Imagine resettling in Atlanta or Charleston or Florence or any town in the southeastern United States. Oh, and, and imagine having just left a country that said no Jews allowed, that had legalized discrimination, coming to a country and seeing signs like these, or signs like these. As a nation founded upon the principle that all people are created equal, we are still wrestling with the legacy of a time when some people were enslaved to others, of a time when it was perfectly legal to discriminate against some Americans, and it, when it was permissible and even tolerated to enforce segregation and separation through sanctioned violence, through boycotts, lynchings, and the like. We are still wrestling with this legacy today, not just in the southeastern United States, but across our country. A legacy that despite the Voting Rights Act, despite Brown versus Board of Education, 
despite the removal, thank goodness, of the Confederate flag from our state house grounds, still lingers. Because we have not yet created a land that truly grants liberty and justice for all. And I would suggest that the history of the Holocaust can inform our conversations about justice. Many survivors, many children of survivors, many refugees from the Holocaust became active in the civil rights movement. And I would share the words here of Rabbi Joachim Prince, who spoke at the March on Washington in 1963. He said, when I was the rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, I learned many things. The most important thing I learned under those tragic circumstances was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem. The most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. They remain silent in the face of hate, in the face of brutality, and in the face of mass murder. America must not remain silent. It must speak up and act from the president down to the humblest of us for the sake of the image, the idea, and the aspiration of America itself. Our children, yours and mine, in every school across the land, each morning pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States and to the republic for which it stands. They, the children, speak fervently and innocently of the land as a land of liberty and justice for all. The time, he writes, I believe has come to work together, for it is not enough to hope together, and it is not enough to pray together, to work together for this, that this children's oath pronounced every morning from Maine to California, from north to south, may become a glorious, unshakable reality in a morally renewed and united America. The legacy of the Holocaust of tolerance and justice is not just for some communities, it is for all of us. And while I have lifted up this afternoon because our time is running short, just a few examples of the ways we as our nation still strive for justice, I would acknowledge that we have work to do in combating hatred in its many forms. These include, but this is by no means a complete list, racial equality for all Americans, disability rights, GLBTQ rights, and religious tolerance. And I would be remiss, and this would be a whole other talk, if I did not mention the plight of the thousands of refugees who are fleeing violence and persecution in Syria who yet don't have a safe place to go. But time is short, so I will end with a Jewish value that has guided much of what I've shared with you this day. It comes from the first book of what we call the Torah, what you call the Old Testament in Genesis. It says God created humans in God's image, which means B'Tselem Elohim. And as such, we're all created in God's image. Nobody is more valuable than anybody else, or we're all of infinite value. It's a teaching that guides as well the prophetic voice of the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who fled Nazi Germany in the 1930s and witnessed the Holocaust from these shores. He wrote, morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings. Indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. In a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Thank you.